Test, test. Test. Test, test. I always hear Rogan say to keep this uh, fist away from your face. Yeah, you want to talk right into the mic, you know? And you can move it around, but, like, talk right into it. I wouldn't move it with all the props we have. Yeah. Are we live yet or what? Yeah, you're live. Oh, thanks, Q. <laughs> so I want to kind of take a minute. Give me the close-up on me. Make it about me. Give me that. So I want to take a minute and introduce... Jesus, John. Minute, Fuck. Introduce someone that I think is going to be very cool. I think it's going to be really one of the coolest segments we've done. It's going to be pretty badass. Um, this is a guy who literally, you know, you always have that one person when you show up and you hit the mat, so you go to train, that kind of rolls up on you like, hey, man, and you're not sure if he's like a friend or he's going to kick the fucking shit out of you. <laughs> so... This dude rolls up on me, you know, super kind, loving, says all the right things. Um, and I'm like, he's like, yeah, let's get some rolls in. Come down to the end of the map. And I'm like, all right. And then I get to hear some of his backstory. And he has a phenomenal story. He's right up my alley in terms of business, just where he's gone, what he's done. And I start to hear more and more, and everybody talks, you know, super awesome about him, super inviting, made me feel right at home at 10th Planet. And we just both share a share love for 10th Planet. And then I find out, you know, he's done some military contracting. He's got a home business. He's got all this stuff. And he's built it all from the ground up, and he has an awesome story. AG from Toehold. Thank you. Awesome. So tell, tell, let me know, you know, and I want to give a special thanks to KVAR, and we're in the KVAR studios with Q and Melody and Rory. I want to give a, a big shout out to them and go check out www.kvar.com. Uh, tell me, AG, how did you get here? And tell us to give everyone, give the listeners a little snapshot of your story. From the very beginning, um, well, I guess it all started from a need. We had, I had a pair of flip flops um, that broke on a hike that I was on in the mountains in San Diego where I grew up. Um, born and raised, Vista, Oceanside area. Uh, grew up on the beach, in the water. Um, and I had a pair of flip-flops break on me. We were probably four miles back from camp. And I took some 550 cord, weaved it between my toes to hold the flip-flop together, and hiked back to camp. And this, the, um, the motion of the rope going back and forth that sawed between my toes I remember thinking I need to get a super durable pair of flip flops because I go everywhere in flip flops, um, everywhere. What's well, your brand? <laughs> now it's my brand. Now it's your brand. But since I was a kid, I always wear flip flops. And being from San Diego, you go if you go to church, the dude there has flip flops. If you go to a funeral, people are wearing flip flops. If you get married, they're in flip flops. So it's just normal footwear for me. That's fucking awesome. That's so laid back. So how, you know, take, take me back a little further. How did, how did this, we, that's where the idea was born. How did we get to you sitting here and being this jujitsu practitioner and find me on the mats? And, you know, what, what took you through the contracting and, and everything else? What was, where's this drive come from to start the business? All of that. So the, the way it went after I broke that pair of flip-flops, um, at that time I was a military contractor. We worked, um, primarily with like amphibious type environments. So the company we worked for dealt with logistical um, issues the military would have when it pertains to water. Um, if, if your ship sinks, how do the guys survive at sea? If the helicopter crashes, how does everybody get out and survive until rescue? Um, if your Hummer rolls over into a canal full of water, how do the guys get out? If the MRAP goes into a canal armored vehicle, it's designed to be basically impenetrable, how do guys get out of an armored vehicle? So um, our team and our company that we work for would come up with solutions like that for the military, and specifically the Marine Corps. Um, and at the time that this happened, I was a contractor on Pendleton, Area 53, with the Gila Dunker program. Um, and I was just about to be sent over um, with the 31st MU over to Okinawa. Um, I got to Okinawa, and Okinawa was like a subset of Japan. Real similar to how... I, th I think of Karate Kid Part 2. Exactly, yeah. Um, I heard that it wasn't technically filmed there, but I don't know that it was or wasn't. But Was Mr. Miyagi there? He was not. Okay. Um, Camp Pendleton. So I was in Pendleton, um, just about to... Just got to Okinawa, and the Japanese workers in Japan are phenomenal. 
Um, oh, what I was going to say was, so Okinawa is sort of how Hawaii is to America, where okay. it's part of the All U.S., right. but they don't really consider themselves American. They're Polynesian. They have their own culture, things like that. Um, it's real similar to Okinawa, where they're a little bit darker skinned. They're way, way more laid back. It's a vacation spot for Japan, but it's technically under the Japanese flag. The guys there that work in the leather um, industry are phenomenal, dedicated. Um, they they give their whole life's work to it. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go find one of these dudes. And Okinawa is just a formidable jungle like you would picture in like Vietnam or Brazil. Just everything in the jungle will kill you. Spiders bigger than my hands. Oh, my God. Venomous snakes, um, creatures you can't even describe what they are. Huge centipedes. Like in Indiana Jones, remember when they're going through the tunnel? And oh, it's just the it's, Temple of Doom. Yes, it's gross. <laughs> um, and I was cruising around in flip flops there. So I go to a hut. I meet a Japanese guy, and we have our translator. And I ask the guy um, if he can make me a pair of flip flops. And I kind of give him a, a blueprint of what I want. And after some back and forth, um, he helps me create a pair. And then I have them. Um, they're kind of like the leather's hard. They're hard to break in. I'm thinking, like, did I get the right pair? After about a week, they break in, and my foot fits perfectly in them, and I just can't break these things at all. No matter what I do, I just cannot break them. So we do our time in Okinawa. Um, I come back to the States, and I have a pair of finally, years later, those flip-flops wear out, and I send one of my buddies back to Okinawa who's like a service guy, and he picks me up a few more pairs from that same guy, and that guy has since gone on to sell flip-flops out of his tiny hut in like the northern part of Okinawa. So um, a few years goes on. I'm working for Apple now um, as a manager. Our contract, uh, during the Obama administration, the contract kind of came up for for grabs. We weren't sure if we were going to have it or not, what was going to happen, who we were going to fall under the guidance of. Um, so I had an opportunity at Apple that I took as a manager Um, And I was luckily and blessed to be one of the last managers under the Steve Jobs heir at Apple. It's amazing. Um, So they sent me to Las Vegas to kind of revamp one of the stores they had out here that they were having a lot of trouble with. And then the time came where I needed some flip-flops. And nobody was going back to the jungle. And I was like, I got to figure out what to do. Um, I talked to some of my buddies over at Rainbow. And... um, I wore them for a while, but they just weren't what quite what I wanted. They make a great brand. Sparky there has been making flip flops for like forty six years. Right, it's remarkable what they make, um, but not my style for wearing them every single day, hiking, hunting, all that type of stuff. So I start figuring out how to do leather work. Um, I get on YouTube. Uh, first, I talk to everybody in town. I talk to saddle makers. I talk to guys who make gun holsters. Um, I talked to one guy who was like a weird bondage fetish dude. Oh and I was like, God. I got to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, but finally, like, I went to the store. I bought some leather. I didn't even know what leather, like, exactly what leather I should choose or what it really looked like and what's the difference between, like, a thick vegetan leather versus that weird shit you see, like, in nice cars or, like, on furniture. And I had to educate myself on everything. So once I started learning that, I just bought thousands and thousands of dollars worth of stuff and just trial and error, trial and error, trial Q, and error. Q, you must know good leather. You go to those places where the men put on the leather. You must know that. Just be into that kind of thing. Hey, man, we don't, we don't talk about personal <laughs> things. <laughs> right now. The crisscross uh, hey, yeah. shotgun you know. shell holster. Yeah. yeah. I've seen you in a bandolier or two. A bandolier. <laughs> so, <laughs> seriously. So... This is crazy. You know, it's funny because you got me thinking, you know, and I know everybody, when they get dive deep into their, their craft, like when I have Rory in here, he like, he has every wire that's known to man. He's like the wire guru. And then you have, you know, Q knows everything about cameras. I, when I, I got a taste of this, when I got into shooting and I got, I, I started to work with bag companies. And I tell you, so somewhere along the way, I became like a bag guru. I don't know what it is. I was working with all these companies with different bag companies, and people would ask my opinion about bags, and then I had to become like a fabrics expert. And the fabrics game, yeah. like the leather game, is fucking insane. Like you just hit the nail on the head when you start talking to people that make saddles and holsters, and they're talking to you about rawhide and it, it, everything else. It really is. It, it's crazy how deep it goes and how detailed it can be. So you're 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 digging through all this data and doing all this research. How do you come up with the formula that beats all formulas? Because we're going to get to some of the testing that's been done, but how do you get to the formula? It costs a lot of money. A lot of time and money. A, a lot of time and a lot of money. So 
Um, what I was doing when I started doing this, I wasn't doing it as a business. I just wanted to make myself. You just want to make some some badass for flips. myself. Right. I just wanted to figure it out, um, and I wound up taking so much of my time and so much money that um, at this point I had um, retired from Apple and had gone on to do some consulting work, and then wound up uh, working for Toyota, phenomenal company. Um, and I had just probably been with them six months, and it was taking so much of my time after I kind of figured out, I would say, quote, unquote, a formula for the level of skill that I had at the time. Right. That I wound up making the jump um, that everybody wants to make, but everybody's scared to do it. And I listened to enough podcasts. I talked to enough people. And luckily, I have enough smart friends that um, – We'll just be like, fucking go for it. And then the, one of the big influencers was Coach Casey. Um, you know, he had he talks about um, working for Shell, having a great job. He has a family to take care of. He has a certainty of the pay. Shell's not ever going anywhere. Mm. And then just saying, fuck it, I'm going to quit my job, give up a six-figure, a high six-figure salary, and start doing jujitsu. And obviously he knew jujitsu and he knew how to teach jujitsu, but like, how do you start a business? Are people going to want to show up? Right. So seeing the balls that it took to do that, I'm like, I mean, worst thing that happens is that I fail. I think, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's an amazing story. Um, in the first place, when people come in or we, t we talk to folks or you listen to podcasts and you hear people about taking that leap and taking that, that jump. And in many ways we all do it. I, I started out in the corporate world and, and like I said, and like the academy was the plan B thing, and then other things fell into place that kind of led me down this path. And, you know, I guess, you know, I, one of the easy things about me has been like when life kind of gives me that road, I'm not afraid to take it. You know, I'm not afraid to say, eh, you know, I really enjoy this. Um, but I think the scary thing for a lot of people, AG, is they, they, they're afraid to turn a hobby into a profession. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the fear. And Coach Casey talked about it. We were just at the Bell Promotions, and he touched on it. He said, you know, if you want to do this, if this is something you want to do, you know, and you want to pursue it, come sit down with me. You can spend, spend time with me if you want to make this a career. And I've had, like, Bruce in here from Quest, and he said the same thing. He's like, if you want to dedicate your heart and soul towards developing a brand, and that's what it is now. It's developing a brand. And you want to do something like you've done with Toehold and, and you're doing, come find me, you know, and follow me around. You may have to... Not everybody has it as lucky as we all are, Casey, where we're, we're, we're willing to go broke, which is basically yeah. what it is, yeah. um, as funny as it is. And in many ways, we're lucky because you had good jobs and you were able to put money into your passion and time into your passion. And you do go broke. There's no question about it. It's broke on time or broke on money or a little of both. You're putting so much time, effort, and energy into it. Some of these guys, they're, they're afraid to take the leap at zero. What advice do you give entrepreneurs or people out there that that they're at that crossroads and they don't know what to do is it a combination of two kind of have the good job and milk it as long as you can or don't be afraid to dive in when you don't have the resources <clears throat> where, where do you do it i would say the very first thing you should probably do is start doing jujitsu because um <laughs> with jujitsu you go out on the mat and you get fucked up all the time you lose all the time you get embarrassed every single day if you compete you're going to go out on a mat in front of all your friends and family, and you're going to get fucking beat, and you're going to get beat bad. So the things, if you can deal with that, then something happening in business doesn't really mean shit. There's a lot of truth to that, and I know, um, you know, fighting's a great metaphor for that, jiu-jitsu, and, you know, we always say, like, jiu-jitsu wins, but there's some truth to that, and I think, you know, I'm surrounded by people that at one point or another have always had their small businesses or their own business. I, I think in this day and age, and I'll, I'll, I'll make kind of a somewhat bold statement, I think no matter what you do, if you don't have a side hustle, or you don't have something that you're passionate about or you're not expanding or growing your own business, you're failing, I mean, in my opinion. I, yeah. I, I think you have to, even if you're working at Apple, even if you're working at Shell, even if you're, you're you're John working at like like I said I worked in finance I went to the academy I didn't have to go, my you know it was always put in my head that you got to have this plan B you got to have this plan B, if, if you're a photographer and you work for a company and you don't have some side gigs, I I think you're failing, yeah, um, even at Apple so as the culture changes as leadership changes things like that you could just run into somebody and it's not really the style at Apple but you could just run into somebody that just doesn't like you 
Right. Doesn't like your philosophy. We were military contractors, and the president decided that maybe we shouldn't have a job anymore. So you could run into scenarios like that, um, but you should own the things that you're doing. Now you did some, in, you know, a little bit of in, intense training. You, you, like you said, diving and everything. And I even saw a picture of you getting waterboarded. <laughs> <laughs> Those pictures weren't supposed to exist, yeah. but so in this um, day and age, everybody has a phone. In this day and age, you know, everybody's shopping Laden, right? So you know, it's it's one of those things. Uh, you know, it's pretty crazy um, the discipline that things teach you along the way, and that's what you touched on with jujitsu. And there's some of the the snippets that we might talk about. Or uh, touch on. We can that either, was... Um, these are G14 classified. We can either <laughs> confirm nor deny that they came from anywhere in this building. This was a, a recon um, school that was uh, that we shared the training tank with. Right. And they were doing some um, intensive water training Amphibious. here. Amphibious. Yeah. Um, yeah, those were, we shared the pool with, uh, with the recon schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. um, so we would do our training and they would do their training um, simultaneously. Can we show the one on the waterboarding? If you want. Q, can, can we punch up the the waterboarding one? Is that, oh, who's that guy? Uh, that's me. That's pretty crazy. So we're elevated. Um, hands are tied. Heads Simulates are drowning, right? Yeah, so so the best way to describe it, if, if you want me to, picture that you were being burnt to death. Did you give up all the secrets, man? You can't talk. You can't do anything. Yeah. You just... You're just sitting there dying. That doesn't look, you know, it's funny about that cue is that doesn't look fun even in a photo. Like, you know, you can stage a photo. <laughs> like, that doesn't even look fun in a photo. So let me say this about the burning. So imagine you about were... About the burning, man. Imagine but... you were being burnt to death. You're no. inhaling smoke. The fire's burning your skin. You could smell your skin burning. Eventually, you have the luxury of dying, and it goes away. I'll be straight. I think my sisters waterboarded me when I was a child. We had a pool, and I think I think they did that to me, not knowing that they were waterboarding me. But I, I had a rough childhood. I think they tried to drown me a couple times. You would definitely know if you were waterboarded. Show Fuck. me on the doll where he touched show, it, Yeah, John. show me on the doll. With waterboarding, it never goes away, though. That feeling never oh, goes fun. away. So the feeling and the panic of drowning will continue to be there forever until they stop pouring water on your face. And you don't get the luxury of dying like you would in a real drowning. You're stuck in that situation. If we tried that here, would we get in trouble? Is there some sanctions that we, we can't? Can we do that here, Q? Can we waterboard? I think the Geneva Convention uh, <laughs> this covers is that shit. Really in <laughs> this day and age, you just change the name. We could call it like a reformed baptism. Vascular restraint. Yeah. Baptism. Ba we're baptizing people. So. This is crazy. So, you know, going through these things, these kind of trial by fires, like you brought up, even jujitsu is, is, is one of them. It leads you to that point of that crossroads, and you make that decision to say, I'm going to do this, and this is going to be my passion, and I'm going to dive into this. How many years are you into toehold, and, and how did you get to the point where you're like, I can sell these? Because that's a different point. Yeah. A lot of people talk about, like, hey, I'm going to start a business, or I'm going to down this road. But when you make that first sale and people hand you cash, you're yeah. like, I can actually sell these fucking things. So it, it, um, it came to a point to where I had, at the time, I'll say, a decent pair for my skill level, and a buddy wanted them, and then another buddy wanted them, and another buddy wanted them. And I remember going to um, 10th Planet Oceanside's open house, and we were walking off the mat, and there was, fuck, 80 people all there. Eddie Bravo was there, Geo Boogie, all those guys. Boogie. And the mat off the mat was just packed full of flip flops. I remember two guys being like, "Damn, I can't tell which one's mine." It was nothing but black flip flops, mm. and I could clearly see which ones my were, which ones were mine. So that wasn't really the moment, but that was one that stuck out of my mind as being like, "Damn, these flip flops are way better than these other ones." Um, another time was I work for EBI, do operations. We set up the mats, we do bracketing, that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, once the event starts, we do the bracketing, kind of put out all the fires that start. Um, um, competitors would hand me their flip-flops every time they go on the mat. I'm the last person they talk to before they go out and compete. <clears throat> and then all night long, people are handing me their flip-flops and handing me their flip-flops. And I remember thinking, I should start selling these guys flip-flops. Um, I have so many people asking me for them already, um, and they were really shitty flip-flops, that these guys should wear our flip-flops. So that kind of started the idea, but at no point did I ever decide, hey, I'm going to start a business, I want to make money. I just wanted to produce dope shit. So talk. To, speaking of dope shit, talk to me about these Louis Vuitton, very limited $200 ones. How do you go from 
carving and weaving and whittling flip flops <laughs> to now you're doing Louis Vuitton <laughs> whittling. <laughs> whittling. <laughs> Those actually came upon us pretty quick. So um, a large misconception is that Louis Vuitton is leather. Um, Louis Vuitton, like a Louis Vuitton bag, will have leather on it, but it's usually at the ends or the handle. The actual material, like the brown part with the monograms on there, that's a rubber-infused canvas that was wrapped around trunks back Those in the old days. sons of bitches. They're charging us a boatload for... <laughs> it's, it's great material. You're paying for the licensing, right, in that? No, no, there's no licensing. You don't need it. So we're not selling them as a Louis Vuitton product. It's the same way that the Goodwill will sell you a Levi's jacket. They're mm -hmm. just recycling it. Um, but what we're doing is we're reusing the material. So how we've reused the Louis Vuitton bag... We're also reusing the cow leather on there. We're reusing the 550 cord. We're reusing the tread. It's part of the manufacturing process. So it's just part of the recycling process. Now, if we branded them as this is a authentic Louis Vuitton flip-flop, obviously we'd get in trouble. And Louis Vuitton doesn't make shit as nice as this anyway. So people <laughs> would know. So we had the we had up uh, Q pull try to pull that that Instagram back up or the website rather the website. So you get to the point where the business is is now going hot. You know, you're selling the the product and you're pushing it out there. What's the big turning point? What's the big break? I mean, because you've worked with a bunch of people. You have Ben, uh, knee to the face, Askren up there, and then uh, <laughs> you know a, a bunch of people. You know, you've worked with a ton of people. You've rubbed elbows with a ton of people, obviously through the fight scene. Yeah. Um, at what point do you say? Now, this is another different point to all my entrepreneurs out there. At what point do you say, I got something here? Like, I really got something. <clears throat> well, there was a point you touched there. So once we started the company, um, it became so overwhelming that I had to leave Toyota, and I had to just do it. I had We had so many people wanting them. And then a guy was like, hey, do you guys sell shirts? And I'm like, ah, fuck, I don't have shirts. I don't have time for shirts. <laughs> and then we're like, all right, well, let's fucking put an order for shirts. And we got shirts coming in. And someone's like, can you do a different color? And then someone's like, well, don't you do rash guards? So everything that we've ever created has been the need of a customer wanting that. Um, and there's been obviously milestones. The one that's been the most recent that probably gave us the most exposure is, is uh, Ben Askren. Yeah. Um, before he was in the UFC... Um, he had posted that his flip-flops broke, and a good buddy of ours, uh, Brandon McCaffrey from 10th Planet Decatur, um, he messaged me and said, hey, Ben Askren needs a pair of flip-flops. Shoot him a DM. And I did. We made him a pair. Um, to us, he was just a normal guy. And doing jujitsu, like you rub elbows with guys sure yeah phenomenally good guys and it's a small it's a really a small world like like i, I was telling you before we, we went hot uh you know i'm not as well versed in the fight game I, i'm more versed in the jujitsu game because that's where my friends came from the competitive jujitsu and uh i know a few guys you never know who you're on the mat like ben saunders i, I was funny i was i was telling ruben alvarez a good buddy of mine hey uh you know i was on the mat with with ben and he goes he's one of my best friends he was at my academy graduation tell him you know me and i'm like yeah and tell him you know you know he's like yeah definitely connect with him it, the world becomes small quick yeah, and everybody kind of knows everybody, and everybody kind of gets to 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 chat and really fast, and especially coming out here, you know, I made a couple of quick friends uh, via other friends I had, and everybody's kind of open. And it, you're right, it shrinks really fast in this in, in, on the mat. That's probably the best way to put it. You'd be surprised how quick you get to know somebody when they choke you out or when they bleed in your mouth. Ugh, gross, but true. Uh, or you get Mercer from them or something. Yeah, you know, we catch their ringworm. Catch their ringworm. So you 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 you're flourishing and you get all this stuff up and running. Everything comes from uh, a request, and you get into rash guards and you get into belts and now you have all kinds of people posting and ambassadors. Um, you, you know, you get the fanny bags, everything, which I gotta get. I still gotta get a fanny bag from you guys. Um, I've totally bought into the fanny bag thing, uh, and they are coming back. So fuck anyone that says otherwise. At, at, you know, you kind of no hit that comment. tip. <laughs> you just can't wear them around your shoulder. I don't understand that. I, I don't do the shoulder. I do the cross body sometimes. Um, I don't do, like, the full the full shoulder. I do the cross body once in a while. But um, you, you, you start getting into hats. Where does it go from here? Are jeans the next thing? We haven't even made our best stuff yet in my eyes. I love that answer. Um, so the cool thing with the leather industry is when we first started buying leather the guys who make the best leather they're not going to sell you their shit even if you had the money to buy it because their stuff is so prized 
that you have to have the skills to even use it. Yeah, a Coke dealer keeps the best Coke for himself. Best way to put it. Great so, analogy. Yeah, that's the you know. I, I mean, wouldn't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's it's true. A chef always has the best samples. So you know, it, it's one of those things that you know, small business is interesting. And you're making all these to order now, or are you hitting production level? Everything is custom. Okay. So um, the cool thing with what we do is uh, a customer could contact us. They could have their a vector file of their school logo um, or whatever logo they like. They could send it to us. We'll actually produce a metal stamp, and we'll strike that into the leather, um, giving it a real customization um, look. And then they'll send us measurements of their feet, and we'll um, produce the flip-flops <clears throat> excuse me, to specifically fit that person's individual feet. In jiu-jitsu, people have some fucked up feet. Oh, and my you know God. Who, you guys know who you are. Yeah. I do, too. Um, no, so we're able to make flip-flops for people that normally may not be able to wear them because their feet are so mangled or they've been broken or they're just terrible looking. Now, why wouldn't every gym do this? It seems like it'd be a great markup. It'd be a great, a great deal for them to sell in the gym, right? Um, we're not, we don't produce in the fashion necessarily that um, it's mass produced for everybody. We do an individual basis. So if a school wanted to buy some stuff from us in bulk, we have like really nice rubber flip-flops for getting wet, for going in the shower, things like that, that they can get. The leather flip-flops are, are much higher end. They're harder to make. They're more expensive. They're more durable. Um, those are more wearing to the gym, wearing out, going hiking. They're not, f uh, you could wear them if your feet are sweaty or wet, but you don't want to wear them going through water because as we know, like with leather a baseball gets... glove, or with a, leather will start to stretch as it's wet and you'll lose that custom shape um, if they get fully submerged. Now we have some products we're working with now like rubber fire hose and things like that that um, are gonna bypass that problem. We have customers now, um, uh, we have several fishermen in Florida that have been ordering from us and we have some tour guides down in um, Patagonia that go through the water quite a bit, and they need something for a real wet environment. So we're really yeah, I would think that, that would be a, a passion play for you too. The water-based stuff yeah would definitely be something. And you have a pair here for a customer that that has shotgun shells. The top washers are made out of the um, the back end of a shotgun shell uh, where the primer is. Yeah, so it's pretty the brass. So that that's pretty. Um, pretty fucking awesome i mean it really is it's it's an awesome story and we were talking about this a little bit off air uh well, well first of the, the rash guards we have the don't be a weak bitch rash guard here which is awesome i mean if you if you fight or do jujitsu that's just a fucking cool logo and and some hats and some stuff hey john you got to bust out the ones that took around man you yeah, got to no. show those oh, yeah AG. so so oh, yeah. there's well let me build it up there's there's, <laughs> there's some extensive testing <laughs> That goes on in the toehole facilities, and uh, we we had a chance to be a part of this extensive testing. And, and AG and I were going back and forth. And we want to do something, so he's always ch testing the durability. So in case um, you know you have that that AD or that that moment, um, these flip flops will survive, but you may not. Uh, they managed to take two rounds before penetration in the flip flop, so we can show the durability. But um, if you wanted to use these as an emergency vest. For a nine millimeter, you probably could get away with it for at least one round. Am I right? If I'm ever in an active shooter scenario, I'm using those to cover up my groin. Groin and heart would probably be. Mm. If you could tape one to your head, I mean, if you could develop, I mean, that's pretty, pretty awesome. But the extensive testing was toe hold helmets, dude. Yeah, the extensive testing was done in a in a cryogenic chamber <laughs> under, under strict <laughs> lab coats <laughs> with white papers. I, I saw the footage. So, but yeah, th I mean, this just speaks to the durability. I mean, these things take a beat, and you said you even shot. Um, there, there was a little bit of a of a he, his aim was a little off. We we got a shot here, but it just shows the durability of the flip flop. I mean, these things just take a take a pounding. I mean, they didn't shred. They didn't fall apart. I mean, they could still be worn. Uh, but pretty pretty badass. I mean, this pair is our what we call our heavyweights. These are solid leather, so they're um, four layers of nine ounce leather. It's it's always cool, AG, to be able to be like, and, and Q, tell me if I'm wrong, to be able to be like, our flip flops are so durable they'll take a bullet. <laughs> That's a hell of a tagline. It's a hell, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> that's I, a hell I would of a tagline. I'd be like, it, when you're talking about these these over molded ones, I would I would be like. They're so durable, we shot them. I mean, you have to put yeah. you have to put that up there. I'd like to shoot one with a shotgun shell and see what it looks like after. Walking through the desert, um, 
I don't want to step on a cactus and have them go through my foot. So we need that's a great real actually, durable yeah. shit. Yeah, or a nail. Oh, a nail's not even. I I rammed a um, an ice spike through the bottom and it didn't even make it through the tread. Wow, oh, shit. Mm. So. Yeah, I mean, and then you get into belts, and then you get into some other stuff, and you're starting to toe the line of some areas. When do, when do and I want to get into your secret sauce, but when do the bags and the jeans come? Because that's the next evolution. So did, being did, from, did being, you just say toe the line, John? Did you mean that? Yep. Oh, man. You, you ruined my subtle <laughs> nod. <laughs> being from San Diego, jeans will never be anything we'll have um, on our site. Okay. I don't wear pants hardly ever. No pants. He's not wearing pants now, guys. No pants. <laughs> <laughs> Shorts Secrets either. Secrets out, AJ. Shorts either. Um, with the rash guards, though, uh, so we use real rash guards, and what that means is these are the rash guards that like we grew Fishermen up body wear, surfing, yeah. um, sun protection, things like that. They're designed to withstand abrasion, and they're designed um, to be a little bit thicker, to offer you a little bit more protection. Now, they're not hotter in any way. Explain that a little bit, because people don't understand what a real rash guard is. I, I know because I've, I've spent a lot of time in Miami with guys who fish, mm -hmm. and the sun is really intense, yeah. and I've had it explained to me. And I've gotten crappy rash guards from gyms and stuff where they're, they're paper thin. Explain that a little bit, the difference between what you're buying. So what a rash guard is, it's designed for body surfing or surfing, primarily, primarily body surfing, where your stomach is going to be rubbing up against the board, the sand, and the wax, and just tearing your like your belly up. So you'd wear a rash guard to protect you from that um, that sort of fraying motion that's going to happen in the water. Um, and then being in the sun all day, you have the zinc on your nose. You put some sunblock on your head, and then the rash guard protects you from the sun. Um, when we started doing nogi jujitsu way back in the beginning, it seems like the beginning of time. Um, that's just what we wore because T-shirts would stretch, they would elongate. And um, back uh, in the, shit, I guess you'd call it the old days now, you used to be able to grab the rash guard. So when you did no gi, um, at least the schools I trained at, grabbing the gi, grabbing the short, or sorry, grabbing the rash guard, grabbing the shorts in a no gi scenario was common. It wasn't until much later that um, you didn't grab it. So they needed to be durable, they needed to be a little bit thicker, they need to be strong. Yeah, a lot of people don't don't understand the true difference because a lot of gyms obviously have skimped on the shirts and they'll they'll issue stuff that's paper paper thin and you'll grab and you'll be like, this isn't a rash guard. It's not a true rash guard. It's just kind of a tight it's like shirt. Like a thin nylon Chinese material. Yeah, it's just a shirt. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not a traditional yeah. rash guard. Um, yours, once you feel the material and, and especially the one right here, um, it's it's distinctively different. It's it's very heavy. It's it's strong and I, and I love the logos and some of the edgy stuff you're doing and it's made in America is it really it is see that's that's huge and especially in this community um, you're manufacturing all this this the the flops in America you're manufacturing you know the shirts are being made in America um, you know is that something that's important to you with every product going forward uh, it, it is. Obviously, like the, some of the materials for like the shirt I'm wearing, I think the material is made in China, um, but the shirts are sewn and manufactured in the U.S. In the U.S., yeah. Um, which brings me to what I want, because it's about what I want sometimes. I, I, I want those sombreros, you know, those sun hats, Q? I want one of those, like, you know, the ones that are popular now, everybody's wearing the, it's not a sombrero, but it's like a straw hat. And I want one with the the, the, day, the uh, day labor hat. Yeah, the day labor hat. Or a oh, lifeguard yeah. hat. You a mean? lifeguard hat. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's what I meant to say. Yeah, the, the day labor hats. <laughs> but that's 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 what I want to see come because those hats obviously offer you great coverage from the sun. But I just think they're fucking awesome, and um, I'm always racking my brain for cool shit that you know makes you look ridiculous. I wonder how to even ship them to a customer. It'd be hard as hell to ship. I those. know. That's what I was thinking too. I was like, boxing that would be a bitch, but. I don't know. They would be pretty badass. I think as a as a one off, as a limited run, would be pretty cool. Um, but that's that's you know, I mean, there's so many different things you can do. Um, you know, I I think you're going to go in amazing directions. I think you're going to do 150 different different things. But then it leads you. Oh, there we go. There's the there's the shirts. You got I, got, I love these shirts. AG. Yeah, the t Thank the you. t shirts. Nice are, shirts, man. We, yeah, the t shirts are badass. So um, I want to say something about the shirts. So we have a silent partner who works for a very, very, very large company who always asks to remain silent okay? Um, because he's worried that it may affect his job. It's not a competitor, but they that 
company has a shoe industry. They're in that ilk. Yeah. Uh, they don't do flip-flops, but they do, they do footwear. Um, he's also our designer. So all those designs you see, including the one, um, including like the don't be a weak bitch, he designs those from scratch. Some guys will grab images off the internet and they'll lay like a, like a palm tree next to an already created sun. And then they'll put, you know, blank on there. Everything you see uh, we have is done from scratch. Pull that up again, Q. He has a great selection. I didn't realize how deep your selection was. You have a great selection of shirts there. I mean, it, it's, it's. Thank you. Yeah. And what's the turnaround right now on on an order of flip flops? Um, they're three to four, maybe five weeks, depending on what they want to have done. Um, so what we're doing now, we have, um, and this is something that I'm real proud of, is we started. We've made it to a point to where we could start buying leather from um, from tanneries in Africa. And when we first heard about it, um, our, our leather broker had talked to us about using elephant and things like that. And I was like, hell no, I'm not going to use elephant. Oh, fuck. Like, I'm not going to have some dude kill an elephant so we can wear them on our feet. What's wrong with you? <laughs> but he explained to me kind of how the process works. So in these big parks, these big preserves in Africa, and the way he described it is think of a park as like a Yosemite or a Yellowstone. There's no fences, gates. They're just massive t territories. Um, these game wardens who are massively underfunded, They'll go out and they'll kind of track the animals, protect them from poachers, things like that. They'll go out in the morning. They'll look for um, like buzzards or um, vultures to see if any animals had died. If they did, they determine the cause of death. Is there a poacher within the park? If there is, they're going to track them down. They're usually going to kill them. Um, and they'll try to recover like the ivory or the rhino horn or whatever the poacher may have killed. Um, for whatever the cause of death is for that animal, they're going to try to, the first thing they're going to try to do is um, save the meat and give it to the villagers. So if it happened overnight, they could probably recover the meat quickly so the animal doesn't go to waste. They give the meat to the villagers and they'll pull the hide off it. They'll tag it and it's strictly, it's strictly um, um, like governed for the, their local government. Mm. They'll give it to the tannery and they're the only ones that could give stuff to the tannery. So a poacher can't show up to the tannery and sell it to them. Only these government officials can. And then our broker will buy it from the tannery. We'll buy it from our broker. That money directly goes back to the system that f help funds those parks. That's one of their main ways they get funding. So everybody wants animals to live forever and rhinos to live forever, all that type of yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's just not but, reality. But people don't write, like, we all want that, but who's writing a check? Mm -hmm. Well, we are. The normal person um, doesn't write a check. So these parks are super underfunded. And one thing we found out, and this is really bad, is these game wardens, when they run out of money and the funding stops, they'll go and they'll poach the animals themselves. Hmm. So um, when we heard about that, we're like, well, shit, yeah, we'll start buying from, we'll start buying these, um, these, uh, these hides that are coming in from Africa because it directly supports the conservation, the preservation, things like that. Oh, sure. Um, and some of those others are, unbelievably durable, super beautiful. They last longer than almost anything you could possibly imagine. If I wanted a custom pair of like lion flip-flops. We've not got lion. Um, and I think lion is sort of like deer in the sense that the hide isn't particularly strong. Have you had a request for something crazy like polar bear or something? Um, no. Um, I had somebody ask about rhino, and but they were just joking around. I'm like... I don't even think Rhino really has a hide. I think it just has like this durable fucking armor on it. I, I yeah. I mean, I think Louis Vuitton's crazy enough, and I'm sure that was a request born out of a request. Yeah. But I mean, it, it's that's really cool, and it's it's cool on a conservation level. It's cool on a life level, and it's really the right way to do things. And it's it's awesome that you sought that out and you were able to to do it that way. Um, most people wouldn't be as um, morally sound i would say and how they would do things um you know it, how do you go to africa and meet that person or do you like what type of research is involved in finding that dude? i will never step foot in africa oh god the amount of shots you need alone would be <laughs> frightening and then the animals would just take just going to the jungle i had like i had more shots than i probably have tattoos um so africa would probably be very off the books yeah um but there's a, it's a very detailed process. So those people have come over to our small shop in Las Vegas. On our wall, we have like the tags and the documentation that's extremely strict on those items coming into the country. 
Um, they're meticulously tracked. Meticulously. I would imagine. I, w- I would totally imagine. Um, so it's that's freaking badass. And, you know, we're going to have to make it over to the shop. I'm just glad I was able to get you in here and get you a chance to kind of hang out with the, with, with the Arsenal and KVAR crew and, and spend some time with us. Um, obviously, you, we, we share a love for firearms, too. Um, you know, you clearly shot a flip-flop. Uh, you know, what do you think of the building and getting in and getting to see this set up and, and hang out a little bit? This place is dope. Yeah. Super dope. Yeah, we're, we're doing, we're trying to do it right here. It's like, it's a fortress. Yeah. When I pull up to this place, I was like, Jesus Christ. Yeah, there's no doubt. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things, you know, I, I just kind of, I love having business owners like yourself in and taking some time and getting to visit the facility and spend a little time here and meet the crew. We, we're trying to do it right here and have folks in to tell their story. And yours is obviously a super rich one. And, you know, it leads us all the way back to jujitsu. Everything leads back to jujitsu. Yeah. So we get a chance to meet on the mats and, and roll around a little bit and spend some time. And it's really f- a lot of fun in, in terms of seeing, you know, this business and seeing the inside insides of how it ticks and where you've taken it. How long did it take you to get it to this point? So we've been, I guess, officially created as a company. Um, next month will be two years. Amazing. It's, it's crazy with all those SKUs, I mean, and, and everything up on there already, and you're already thinking of what the next thing is. And You'd be surprised what running a $100 million a year Apple store will let you do. Seriously. The, um, the skills it'll give you. Yeah, no, no, no doubt about that. And, you know, the website's top notch. And, you know, where give give the company a big plug. Where can everyone find the stuff and where can everyone reach you? So our website is shoptoehold.com. Um, and our Instagram, that's where we're at constantly. Because she's a DM. We respond back within seconds usually. And that's um, uh, toe underscore hold, T-O-E underscore h-o-l-d yeah there it is and um you have uh you're starting to build out an ambassador program now it looks like and you're starting to get some people involved and 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 wrapped around the brand not just ben kind of pushing it but you have a bunch of people on there and you you know obviously you're going in a lot of really cool directions and i love the photos the photos very colorful thank you and yeah it almost looks like you know like a food page in so many ways those are all taken on iphones so yeah i mean that's the big key right there um you have so much cool gear and so much stuff coming, and you're catering a lot to the female market too, which is obviously a fast-growing one in jiu-jitsu and in fight land. We do, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is um, nobody really makes high-quality gear for girls. No, we were just talking about that. Two is um, if you look at our page, would you rather look at flip-flops and guys or flip-flops and girls? Girls want to see other girls, and guys want to see girls. And the girls we pick are girls that are... Um, very good up and coming jujitsu practitioners. Yeah. No, so they're I, people to follow. They're people that you're going to see them develop over the years. Um, we had Ty in here the other day. I can attest yeah. to that. She's she's definitely doing it. And um, it, it just. It, have, it, you, the, have you rolled with her lately? She's getting really good. No, I, you know, a lot of the, it's funny. I was talking about this with her. It, you know, at 10th at ten Planet, I've noticed a, a lot of the female, I mean, other than them rolling with you, they kind of keep to themselves and they, they roll within themselves. Um, I've noticed that, and I've been to a few gyms where that's the case, and I've been to a few gyms where it's not the case. So, um, you know you know me, I kind of lay back in the cut and see who kind of taps me on the shoulder and, and kind of go from there. Being a bigger guy, I think they think like I'm going to, you know. Just murk them. Murk, murk them <laughs> or something. But I, I kind of lay back and, and see what's what. But, but you know, Ty and I will probably, probably tangle a little bit at some point. I know she's, she's out of here, I think, Friday, so might not get the opportunity but uh you know hopefully down the line you know as more females come into the game because it's it's always still so small percentage you yeah know, in a lot of the gyms um rolling with the girls is good because if you don't use your strength which you shouldn't um you really get your timing because they're super fast they're super technical they're not going to try to muscle you so they're going to use what's often their superior technique to try to bypass what it is that you're doing mm. um and I think for them, it's also good to be able to choke a 245-pound guy. Yeah, it's, it's more self-defense-based yeah. than anything because that's the reality. A guy your size, guy my size is more the reality of what they might come up in a confrontation. So, um, you know, I think that that's more for their 
life training yeah. than almost anything, like just getting a tangle with, with a bigger guy. Any of the girls on our team, if they get their hands, if they get their arms or their legs around your neck and you don't know what you're doing, they're going to kill you. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. I, I, I can live to attest to that. I have a, a, a history with some high-level jiu-jitsu practitioners, so I can attest to that. There's, I've definitely lost more than a few matches to a female in my time. Um, <laughs> And if and to all you guys out there that don't practice any martial art, uh, AG is absolutely right. A lot of the females are going to come at you with a lot of really deft technique, and they're going to hit you with some technique. And you have to kind of be on point. If you're not, and and you don't, like you said, use your strength. You want to try to, you know, work against them in a way that you're flowing. And if you're not, and you have to re resort to your strength, you're fucked. I mean, you're you're yeah. really, you, you know, because they're going to gas you out. There's no doubt about it. Uh, your gas tank is everything against the females. At first, you should stop using your strength. Use your learn the technique. Learn, get mobile. Get good mobility. Um, get your cardio up. And then once you have those three things, reintroduce your strength, and you just become a motherfucker to deal yeah, with. Yeah, I'm, I'm never going to get – I'm going to have to resort to EPO. I'm never going to get there. <laughs> so, it, you know, I, I'm, I have to take it to, a, 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 you know, a ridiculous level to try to compete and stay on that, stay on that game. Um, but, yeah, no, absolutely. And I love what you're doing. So the DM is the best place to find you business-wise. On the website, um, I imagine you have a link to contact yeah, us. Yeah, there's a contact page. Shoot us an email. Um, my phone, um, as much as my girlfriend hates it, and might I say she's wonderful for um, putting up with what she puts up with for me to work with this company. I know shit will work 20 hours a day sometimes. Go to bed at midnight, wake up at 4 in the morning, and I'll do that for days at a time. Um, so big shout out to her for putting up with me. Um, but my phone is always in my hand. So shoot me an email, respond right away. Shoot me a DM, respond right away. Um, what if you're a gym and you want to carry your stuff? Are you up to that? Shoot, yeah. us, a, shoot us a DM. Shoot a DM, hit yeah. the contact us tab. If you're a gym out there or you're anybody looking to carry this stuff, I, I really love it, and I, I love the direction it's going, and I think as you kind of drip out there into more spaces, and especially the ambassador program you're building out, it looks like, it, like it's going in all the right directions. I mean, I definitely love it, so if you haven't checked out Toehold, make sure you check them out. Awesome stuff. I'm loving what they're doing. I think it's just going to keep getting better. I think he's going to absolutely kill it. Uh, believe it or not, right now, we've gone, what, Q, 50 minutes? Seems like 50 seconds. Yeah, 52, brother. 52 minutes. So before we wrap, I want to kind of, uh, you know, touch on one more point. We talked a lot about starting a business, and we talked a lot about, you know, just kind of the general love for the game and kind of diving headfirst in. What's the number one piece of advice? Or to, I mean, not number one, maybe top three to guys out there that, you know, maybe they're looking for a side hustle, maybe they're looking for a way out. What give them that tome of, of wisdom that you kind of lived through? So, um, well, the big thing is just don't stop. I mean, unless you have a shitty idea and you'll know if customers are buying stuff from you, then your idea must be good. Um, but if you have a good idea, just don't stop doing it. No matter what happens, how tough times get, how skimpy your bank account is on Christmas, how many checks you might bounce, just don't stop doing it. Um, and then with that is you've got to have good social media. you got to be posting constantly. And YouTube is the future of everything. So oh we just God, started yeah. our YouTube channel. I was going to talk um, about that. Yeah, YouTube's everything. So if you are into yoga, make a fucking YouTube channel. If you're into jiu-jitsu, record your videos, put them online. YouTube in 10 years is going to be where all the content is watched. You know, I said there's two things I want to – I don't want to stop you, but, like, there's two things I want to touch on from that. I read a piece the other day, and I, I don't know if it, I don't want to give credit to the wrong person, but I don't know if it was one of these, um, uh, who's that lunatic um, social media guy? Oh, I know uh, a lot of them. Yeah, um, Gary Vee or somebody. He, they said, you need to have five or six pieces of content that go out a day, a fucking day. And when I read that, like, I, I sent it to Dave right away, Q. I was like, you got to be shitting me. And it was... Um, 
you know, they said it's not necessarily on one platform. It could be multiple platforms, meaning like Twitter. So like a post on Twitter, a post on IG, a post on fucking LinkedIn. Now LinkedIn is becoming a thing. Everybody's posting stuff on LinkedIn about their business because that's great business to business. Yeah. And, you know, it, it just opens doors. I've had people DM me on LinkedIn, you know, and, and get messages and people are contact. There's so many. We need an I, intern. John. Oh, fuck. I think, I think Instagram's lost a lot of its luster. I think in, my theory is I think Instagram's really great for brand ID and day to day brand ID. Like I look at your page and I see good brand ID. I see good color. I see the page. It tells me what the lifestyle of it's about, everything. But I think they can't figure it out how to make money on it. And that's kind of the struggle. Um, I think it's good to put your name out there. But YouTube, you're absolutely right. Because in our lifetime, everybody's still kind of dealing with the R of like magazines being dead mm -hmm. and paper being dead. I think we're going to see cable TV die. Cable TV is dead, but Netflix, Hulu, things like that, where that content is Streaming, produced, yeah. um, that's going to die too. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, I think we'll see, first of all, what'll save it. I have a theory. What will save it is sports. Sports is going to save streaming networks, and it's going to come down to who gets it. And I believe Captain Moneybags at Amazon, he's going he's gonna to buy it. He's going to get the rights to NFL, NBA. It's only a matter of time. He has more money than Jesus. He's, he's going to be able to throw it at something like that. And mm -hmm. once, he, once Amazon streams NFL, NBA, and Major League Baseball, and, and you know, NHL, it's over. I mean, he's him and Apple are going to control the game, yeah. and they're going to be streaming. And then you're going to have YouTube for everything else, and YouTube's going to be your clips, your snips, everything. You're like, if I want to see a clip from ESPN, I can go right there, and I can see the clip from the show. I mean, ESPN's posting like ten pieces of content a day. Yeah, I don't, you know, just like everybody used to go to Facebook for their news. I don't even fucking put on Channel Five. For, I don't have cable. Yeah. I don't have cable. Who pays for cable anymore? I mean, who, Q, do you pay for cable? You got little... This e dumbass right here yeah. pays for it, man. I haven't had cable in Every years. Month. Who pays for cable? So cable to me is like, it's this thing, uh, it's on its last legs. Because who's paying like these giant salaries for news anchors and for people? I just don't know anymore who's paying for that stuff. So, you know, to me, and I know a lot of people have talked about this, in our lifetime, it's going to probably take about 10 years to see it, but I think you're going to mm. see the death of those things. It's gone. Yeah, yeah. that stuff's gone. And with Netflix, people have talked about this before, but oh, yeah. we have known this for, for quite a while, just having come from a tech background and having a lot of buddies that still work in like, yeah, the Yeah, I know Andrew industry. was talking about it on Joe and, and a bunch of people. What it takes to produce a show on Netflix, we're, you're producing, producing this for free. Uh, essentially. And what somebody produces a dive show on YouTube... They produce it for free. Netflix needs to spend millions of dollars. And, and it and just, eventually, it'll just burn itself it out. It just makes logical sense that everyone have a channel. Red Bull's already there. Mm -hmm. Monster's already there. Yeah. I mean, they're already doing it. And I've said this a hundred times in this office. Q's heard me say it. The first, you know, as far as gun companies and defense companies go, the first gun company that creates basically a reality TV show is, is going to own the market. I mean, it, it, to me, they're going to be, because you're just creating so much content. At the end of the day, it's the content that wins. Yeah. And you have to have the pieces. And it's going to get to a matter of time where you're going to be <coughs> slinging a few GoPros in your shop, and that's going to that's gonna be it. You're going to be like, yeah. all right, I want to stream me making some, some flops. We always look back and we think, like, what if we just invested in Apple or Facebook or one of these companies in the early days? Right now, YouTube is still the early days. I, I believe that. Get a that. channel, get started, get your shit out there, and just keep producing content yeah the more content you can produce and why not like for one hour a day why wouldn't you just say hey i'm gonna go live and make it like a reality show once four times a week you know yeah. it, it, it makes logical sense and then eventually it's going to lead to an app and it's going to lead to you know all that stuff where people can just tune in and they can see their custom you know flops being made they could see the process of something being done i've said it a hundred times in this industry because the gun industry is very similar to the fight industry where we don't have a lot of, it's even worse. We don't have a lot of mainstream ads. You can't run a mainstream ad for a gun. You're never gonna see it. So in my game, it's all social. So I've said over and over again, what, uh, I've asked companies this, what's your media creation program? And they look at me like I have 10 heads because where it's still at is, oh, we'll go in the desert and we'll do a mag dump. Yeah. And that's our media program. The fuck is that? That's not a media program, and it's it, you know it, you have to have a media program today. Whether it's you're running podcasts, tabletops, anything, I you know all the time you know especially in my business, I've been criticized for giving like the secret sauce. I'm like, here's the plan, here it is, go execute it. But the problem is, 
you still have a lot of companies being run by by fat cats that haven't quite got there yet. They like it's like the newspaper game and the and the magazine game. They're willing to lose money to try to keep it alive. Yeah, you know, like I, I think it was Mr. Olympia, which is down here. They were selling booth space and they were trying to sell ads for Flex Magazine to keep that alive because that was dying. You know, I mean, you just can't. It, that's all. All that paper and and even the. The cable TV stuff is just going to be toast. I think streaming will survive because you still have to watch sports. Yeah. If sports moves to YouTube, then everything's gone. Toast. Um, toast. Which I think YouTube wants to do. They're owned by Google. Google has more money than everybody. And The only variable in that is you have Captain Moneybags and you have Apple out there. And, yeah. and they may jockey for something. I mean, he, he's... I'll, am, am I'll say knowing the executives at Apple and knowing... Uh, having met the people on like the board, um, they're the most powerful people out there. Yeah, no, I, I, one hundred percent. So they're the most connected. Google's right there with them. Um, Bezos is obviously rich, but I don't know that he has the same connections politically and interwoven to like a global scale when as I, those yeah. particular guys. And for everybody out there, when I refer to Captain Moneybags as Bezos, everybody knows who we're talking about. <laughs> I mean, he just... He, was I not supposed to drop his name? No, no. He could throw a hundred million at something and it's is like, he, you know, it's like shit in the gonna, wind. Is he going to shut us down? No, no, no. He could. He Anything's possible. But, uh, you know, I've been a big believer of that and I think you're absolutely right. I think, Google, I believe it's Google's the number one used search bar, YouTube's number two. Yeah. So... Part of my souring, I guess it is, on, on, on Instagram is I just think they can't figure out how to monetize it. They're just having a fucking yeah. hell of a time figuring out how to have it generate money. And you're betting what you're betting on is a very difficult bet. You're betting on how many times somebody's going to do this, how many times they're going to swipe down. Nobody looks at old pictures, so it just becomes cannon fodder. You can recycle stuff, use stuff. So I'm a big believer that after you have like a 1,000 pieces of content on Instagram, it really just comes down to stories. I mean, really, everybody's just looking at the stories, like, oh, what's this one doing today? What's that one doing today? I just think it's, you know, it's, it's one of those mediums that's going gonna, gonna to have a hard time having a shelf life beyond the next five or ten years unless they revamp it. I do got a tiny bit of advice, but it's more of a what not to do. Oh, and this not? is a piece of advice that I give to a lot of people who ask us. If you're in jiu-jitsu, do not start a T-shirt or a rash guard company. It's crazy, Q. Did Bruce not say the same thing from Quest Bar? He was like, yeah, don't, don't yeah. start a t-shirt company. And here's why. If I don't sell any t-shirts, it doesn't affect us at all. We're a flip-flop company. Yeah. I could sell flip-flops to every single gym. With rash guards, you can't sell them necessarily to, to let's, let's speak general. You can't sell them to a gi school. You can't sell them to Gracie Hamida. They got their own uniforms. You can't sell them to Gracie Barra, to Gabrina. You can't sell them to any of the major schools. Those guys have their own uniforms. Now you're competing with smaller schools or the large 10th Planet Network where every single gym owner is selling their own gear. You got other brands in there, and now you're selling to such a tiny market of people. If they don't like your design and they don't buy you, out, if they don't buy up your run, you're going to go out of business. Yeah, a T-shirt company, you know, that's that's been – that was social media – AG seven eight years ago, mm -hmm. you could get away with that. You could get in that game. Um, we've seen it. You know, there's been a few that have come up, especially even in the gun industry. We had grunt style. We have had a few kind of hit the scene, but it's you're competing. You're even competing against a bigger animal. You're competing against the Under Armors. You're competing against so many big animals. It gets it gets to be it's fleeting. I would love to see one of the jujitsu soap companies. If they don't I'll do it already, start a subscription service. You know, it's funny you say that because I, I use the Armbar Soap Company. Shout out to Armbar. That do they do a subscription? They don't. They don't. Armbar start doing subscriptions. Yeah, Armbar, I, I use their stuff. Um, they do a good job. There's a couple of them out there, but I've seen a couple of them go belly up too. In the gun industry, we had Fight Soap, which, which started a little yeah. bit in the MMA, and that was in Connecticut, and they went kind of tits up. Um, but, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think, you know, we see a lot of subscription services in the gun industry. Everybody's got an ammo can or something that they're, they're pushing. Uh, I, I think that there's a lot of room in the, in the fight community for some of that stuff to, to come up. Uh, and I would say, the, uh, to add to what you said about shirts, I would say don't start a coffee company. Do, we don't need another coffee company. <laughs> the gun industry is riddled with coffee companies. The, the, you know, and they're all trying to sell them. That's the funny thing about it. They're all like, they all want to parachute out and sell it. But what they are really is marketing companies that sell coffee. There's tons of them. And, uh, you know, I just think, you know, T-shirts, coffee, some stuff's just been overdone and played to death. Yeah. 
you know. What I'm not going to do is log on every month and order more soap or order more coffee. Just I want just to, I want it just to show up. Yeah, just create a reoccurring. That's actually that's why don't you do it? Why don't you just drop ship? I'm too busy. I'm too busy. But yeah, no, awesome advice. I mean, just just a, the conversation's badass. You got so much stuff coming. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I, I, tell I, tell hold soap coming this October. Is that real? No, no. I was gonna say you almost dropped a bomb. <laughs> um, can you can let me ask you this before before we cut out? Is there anything you can say that's coming? Like if I say yes, all right, what? We have, um, so everything we have, we have better versions of them coming constantly. I think this pair is like ni our ninth gen. I'll make a pair, figure out um, how to get make another pair even better, and just discontinue that right away and produce something. There's, there's, that run. There's nothing that like I'm unwilling to do when it comes to that. We have leather slides coming, too, where you slide your foot all the way in. Um, those are coming. Um, they were a huge help. Um, and I'd kind be of, down for a pair of those. For they're, sure. they're really nice. We have a, a buddy that we work with named Ryan the Anvil. Um, he's a phenomenal leather worker in Springfield, uh, Missouri. We've kind of shared some ideas back and forth, but he's by far the veteran. He's been doing this forever, um, and he's kind of shared some ideas with us. So we've figured out um, the right formula in order to do that. We may do it in a sense to where you come to Vegas, you come to our shop, we create them with you, size them with your foot, and you leave with them right there. That'll probably be something later in the year. Could we call it the toehold experience? <laughs> and it airs on YouTube. I like it. On Tuesdays. So awesome, you know, I, I love it. It's just so much awesome stuff, and we could probably spend another hour talking about, you know, so many different things. And it's funny you brought up Missouri. That's where Crossbreed is. There must be something in the water there with the leather. Um, because they're, they're doing tons of leather goods. Shout out to Crossbreed Holsters. Uh, they sponsor the show. They're awesome. But I, I love what you're doing. I love, you know, the. I can't thank you enough for well, being so welcoming and being so kind, especially to me coming into a new mat, coming into 10th Planet. It's been, you know, a, a real joy having you and calling you a friend for sure. Um, I look forward to definitely working with you and having more people on, and especially people associated with the brand. I know we had Ty on the other day. She had a lot of great things to say. Uh, getting to hear your story today and some of the stuff that goes along with it and the journey and especially starting the business step by step. I think you're going to do great things. So to everybody out there, make sure you check out Toehold. Give them a listen. Um, they're just going to crush it. They're doing awesome work. It's not just about flip-flops, but go check out their flip-flops and check out everything else. They got rash guards. They got shirts. They have belts coming. They have hats. A whole bunch of things. They have fanny bags. They hopefully I, I'd like to see a, a backpack at some point. I mean, we have backpacks. Backpacks now. You get a backpack. I mean, I, you know, it's just endless. But I'm loving what you're doing, and I think you're gonna crush it. Uh, I'll give you the last word. We know where to find you. Give me the last word. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you for the support. Shout out to uh, my business partner and coach, Coach Casey. I gotta get him on. Yeah, Coach yeah. Casey's the best. I got to get him on. I know he's busy. Um, I got to talk to him. I, I know um, he's a busy guy, and he's, when he is has the downtime, he spends it with family. But I, I, I got to get Coach Casey on. He'd be a great one uh, to tell his story. But, uh, yeah, shout out to them and 10th Planet for sure. Yeah. For sure. Shout out to our teammates, customers, everybody who supports us. Thank you for everything. And uh, message me if I could do anything for you. Yeah. And make sure you guys like and subscribe. Tune in. This will be up on iTunes in a couple days. So I appreciate everybody. We appreciate everybody's time. Uh, we went over an hour, Q. Uh, we're going to be out. Yep. We out. Thank you. <laughs>